We are Sarah and E.L., PhD students in Brown University's Egyptology and Assyriology Department. Well, there is certainly a lot of interesting academic work happening in Near Eastern studies. The Academy is not the only place to get caught up on the coolest news items. One resource that many Assyriologists subscribe to is the Agade Listserv, compiled by Jack Sasson, the Mary Jane Worthen Professor of Judaic and Biblical Studies at Vanderbilt University. We have scoured the internet for the most exciting news stories and public scholarship related to the ancient Near East, subscribing to our favorite blogs and following the most fascinating research we can find on Twitter. Scholarship can come to us anyway, anywhere, and anyhow. Throughout the month, EL and I will curate a selection of items for interested non-specialists, then we'll share them with you in videos like this so that you can be part of the conversation. We on this channel have long said that we have much to learn from ancient peoples and that their experiences are still felt by us today. This is certainly true for the very relatable feelings of grief and depression. In a piece for Psyche, Dr. Moody Al-Rashid writes about how Mesopotamian medical texts and poems can give us insight into these universal feelings. In a companion piece to Dr. Al-Rashid's original, Shayla Love writes the relatable emotions of depressed people from 3,000 years ago for Vice. In this piece, not only do we get a bit of a recap of the article in Psyche, but also some personal insights into Dr. Al-Rashid and Love's experiences with mental health giving beautiful modern context to these ancient texts. While we were on break, the Getty Villa in Los Angeles hosted a short exhibit called Mesopotamia, Civilization Begins. As part of this run, the Getty blog issued a series of posts by experts in the field on topics related to the exhibit. First up is Dr. Sarah E. Cole writing on how to be king in Mesopotamia. Using primary sources, Dr. Cole takes us through the surprisingly difficult work of being an ancient king. Continuing the series for the Getty is Jeffrey Spear, Senior Curator of Antiquities. In Meet the Mesopotamian Demons, Spear writes about the powerful demons that existed in the Mesopotamian world and how their fearful strength inspired action in humanity. If you follow the American Society for Overseas Research online, then you know their blog has been equally busy this summer. In a piece from May, Dr. Astrid Noon highlights the polychromy of Mesopotamian sculpture. Visitors to museums are used to seeing these sculptures in hues of black, white, and gray. Dr. Noon shows us how vivid these artworks actually were and how 21st century technology is helping bring some of it back. Also for the ASOR blog is Dr. Cecile Michel and her piece on the women of old Assyrian letters. In the time of extensive trade networks between Asher and Kanesh, business was a full family affair. In her piece, Dr. Michel zooms in on the women of these families, showing us the role they played as business people in their own right. Those of you familiar with texts from ancient kings know that they were often pretty quiet when it came to things that might make them seem weak. Well, it turns out Ashurbanipal could find himself holed up in bed hoping for a cup of soup from his mom, just like the rest of us. Head over to the ASOR blog to read more about royal illness from Dr. Isabel Kranz. Among the glitz and glamour of archeological discovery, there's praise for the archeologists leading the work often accompanied by beautiful pictures. Who are these photographers? Mohammedania Ibrahim was one of them. Though one of the first Egyptian-born archaeological photographers, Ibrahim was relegated to merely a footnote in the history of excavation. But new writing is here to change that. You can read more about him and his influential work from Aram Aramco World. As archaeologists have been finding their way back into the field, cool archaeological discoveries are finding their way back into these videos. Back at the beginning of the summer, it was announced that about 250 rock-cut tombs were found in Egypt's eastern desert, about 240 miles southeast of Cairo. The tombs were built over the course of about 2,000 years in ancient Egyptian history. Research is ongoing, and we may have more information for you on this in future videos. In other exciting tomb news from the summer, the memorial tomb of ancient Greek astronomer Aratus was unearthed in the southern Mersin province of Turkey. The famous Greek poet and astronomer was born in 315 BCE and is memorialized with a crater on the moon named for him. Researchers in the area say the discovery is of lasting importance to the history of Turkey. Perhaps the most exciting discovery of the summer was the announcement by the Saudi Heritage Commission that archaeologists had uncovered a mid-6th century BCE inscription depicting the Babylonian king Nabonidus in the northwestern city of Hyle. The area, which was known as Fadak in ancient times, is of great historical importance. And this inscription is one of many giving insight into the role of the Saudi Arabian region in Mesopotamia's ancient past. Not to be outdone, a series of life-sized camels carved into rock in modern-day Saudi Arabia are way older than previously thought. Urgently considered to be 2,000 years old, it turns out the carvings are about 7,000 years old, dating to a time when the land looked very different than it does today. 
You can learn more about the scientists and their work on this stunning revelation from nature. If you're a fan of the ancient world in podcast form, you may have heard of Tides of History. And if you've watched the beginning of this video, you've definitely heard of Dr. Rudy Al-Rashid. Luckily for all of us, back in May, Dr. Al-Rashid was a featured guest on the Tides of History podcast, talking all things cuneiform literature and mental health. Maybe you didn't know that there was an intersection between the ancient world and heavy metal music. Well, now you do. As an introduction to the field, why not check out this interview between Jeremy Swist, heavy metal classicist on Twitter, and the members of the metal band Tabernacle. Stick around on Dr. Swift's blog to learn more about the world of heavy metal and ancient history. Those of us who have hung around the public scholarship sphere of ancient studies for a while know Dr. Amanda Podani as a particularly skilled practitioner. A benefit of this new virtual world is the awesome recording we were gifted of Dr. Podani giving a talk on how cuneiform records can help us reconstruct past lives. Check out her video for the Getty Villa and then check out the rest of her very accessible scholarship. This belongs in a museum. But does it though, if Indiana Jones stole it? The Indiana Jones movies are great fun to watch, but are also known for their misrepresentation of the work that archeolog archeologists do. 40 years after Raiders of the Lost Ark, Dr. Christina Kilgrove writes for Smithsonian Magazine on all things our beloved Indy got wrong. Longtime viewers and commenters on these videos know we like to draw up controversy by suggesting that the world might not treat everyone equally. So naturally, we have to bring up the big classics news of the summer that Princeton University will no longer require its classics majors to take classes in Greek and Latin. The move is part of a larger initiative meant to combat institutional racism in Princeton's intellectual community. You can read more about the decision in The Boar. Speaking of ethical issues, in an article from Pennsylvania State University News highlights the work done by researchers at the university on the ethics of remote sensing. Remote sensing has been used by archaeologists for decades, but the lack of communication with local communities around the practice has brought the technology under closer inspection. You can read more about the important work these researchers are doing in the featured news article. The Epic of Gilgamesh is one of those amazing cuneiform texts that has stayed with us throughout the millennia since it was first recorded in writing. Now you can hear it like never before. Musician Peter Pringle has recorded the first tablet of the epic in song, accompanied in a video showing art inspired by the story. Head over to his YouTube channel to give it a listen. Ancient Greece and Rome, they're mm -hmm. so hot right now. From Crapopolis to Blood of Zeus to Centaur World, the pandemic-inspired animation boom has taken a distinct turn toward the ancient and the mythical. In her piece for Hyperallergic, Chiara Sulprizio explains to us why this very welcome theme is not as simple as it seems. Don't worry, we're not about to leave you without covering the biggest cuneiform news of the summer, the seizure of the Gilgamesh Dream Tablet from Hobby Lobby by the U.S. Department of Justice. More than a decade after Hobby Lobby was first exposed for its role in the illegal sale and acquisition of antiquities, this important piece of literary history has been seized. You can read more about Hobby Lobby and the Gilgamesh Dream Tablet from NY Mag. Even more exciting than taking the Gilgamesh Dream Tablet away from Hobby Lobby is the fact that it will be part of the largest restitution of artifacts from the US to Iraq in history. After the Prime Minister of Iraq met with the President of the United States earlier this summer, it was announced that 17,000 objects would be returned to their homes. While it is impossible to quantify the number of artifacts that have been looted from Iraq, these 17,000 pieces still represent a significant step in the right direction. You can read more about the restitution from Al Jazeera. That's it for our summer roundup. Thanks again to Dr. Sasson for his work on creating this list, to the community for creating awesome things, and to you and your interest. We'll see you next month with October's most interesting items. <laughs>